when I talk to the leading researchers in the field of AI right now, for example, they literally refer to this right now as their Oppenheimer moment. They're looking to his story to say, okay, what are the responsibilities for scientists developing new technologies that may have unintended consequences? Do you think Silicon Valley's thinking that right now? Do you yeah. think they understand this is an Oppenheimer moment? They, I mean, they say that they do, um, and that's, <laughs> that's helpful that at least it's in the conversation, um, you know, and I, and I hope that that thought process will continue. I mean, I think... I'm not saying that Oppenheimer's story offers any easy answers to, to those questions, but it at least can serve as a cautionary mm -hmm. tale. It at least can show, you know, where some of those responsibilities lie and, and have people take a, take a breath and think, okay, you know, what, are, what is the accountability of, of uh, you know, uh, well, the Well, I think it's also going to jumpstart a conversation about the role of scientists and the need for right. us as a society drenched in technology and science to have scientists as public intellectuals. To well, do we feel as if the McCarthy era just sort of, do you, do you feel like, Kip, you're, you're, you've crossed a couple of generations here in the scientific community. Did you, do you feel like scientists sort of from the generation older than you felt that chill? What happened to Oppenheimer? And they were like, all right, maybe I won't get into the political space. I think that some of them did. Mm -hmm. Some didn't. I... Uh, I think uh, that I was much influenced this through my father, who uh, dealt with McCarthyism as a, a uh, chair of a faculty mm -hmm. in Utah at the time when we had a governor who was uh, dictating the Board of Trustees fire faculty for their left-wing left uh, mm -hmm. uh, tendencies. So he went through this. Out and he, he had to stand up for them. He was as the chair of the faculty. So... I went through this uh, in my own family uh, mm -hmm. through him. Um, then I went on and what I saw another aspect of this, which is quite interesting. I spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, I had collaborations with, uh, with Yakub Borisovich Zeldovich, who, who with Andrei Sakharov was regarded as the father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb. Right. And uh, the... And if you asked your R Russian colleagues, why did you build the bomb for Stalin? Stalin was obviously such a uh, such a terror, right. such a terror, and uh, the struggles that they had mm. uh, were in, similar to what Oppenheimer had, but I think more extreme in some ways. Right, Carla, go ahead, Tom. You know, I was going to say, you know the. Even though Oppenheimer was was only in Los Alamos for two and a half years, roughly, you know what he brought to the position is still with us today, in terms of the culture of the laboratory and the commitment to free and open debate, you know, within the mm -hmm. walls. Even though we're still doing sensitive work, and also, uh, you know, the importance of bringing the best technical advice and. We recognize that there needs to be a lot of vo I, I recognize there needs to be a lot of voices in those discussions. Um, but one of the voices does need to be, you know, what is the science? You, the last thing you want to have is have a consequential policy debate based on a faulty understanding of the science. I'm curious what you thought of the line, if you remember it, when Oppenheimer, when I think it was one of the colleagues Oppenheimer says, you're not a scientist anymore, you're a politician. Do you feel like a politician running Los Alamos or a scientist still? So I did my research on neutron scattering, and if I bumped into a neutron in the hall now, I probably wouldn't recognize it. <laughs> um, you know, that's the, that's the role. Right. My job is to enable the science of others mm -hmm. to protect them from all these external factors that might distract them, to make mm -hmm. the case for the resources they need, and to speak truth to power even when it's uncomfortable. Carlo, do you think we'll see more scientists speak out, or do you? I mean, look, there was a chill post-COVID. Look what happened at. Look at what has happened at Anthony Fauci, right? Look at what happened at Oppenheimer. I mean, you, there are a lot of parallels between Fauci and Oppenheimer, right now. I I hope there will be more scientists speaking speaking out. We have a lot of great physicists, of American physicists, are here in the audience. Um, let me make this comment. Um, Having weapons of mass destruction and having living in this planet, humankind thinking just about 
building things to kill one another and trying to dominate one another is obviously madness and stupidity. Uh, but uh, humans are not always so so mad, and there have been a lot of uh, moments in in history. Uh, think about think just about the the, the treaties about um, uh, limiting nuclear weapons that the Soviet Union and the United States were able to negotiate uh, in the moment of the, uh, of, uh, the in the hardest moment of the Cold War with a huge ideological clash and ideological dif difference. Nevertheless, um, reasonable people in power could, you know, decide to sit down. And at that point, scientists and in particular physicists played a big role. That's what uh, Keith was referring to. There was a communication between uh, uh, American and Russian scientists uh, uh, which was uh, both culturally and also directly uh, important for, and I think that's what should happen today. I mean, the scientists, for, for scientists, for, for our world, uh, you know, the Russians are friends, the Chinese are friends. Right. And I think that's what we should learn and tell the politicians, stop this madness of just trying the to prevail. The laws of physics are the have... same in China as they are in the United States, as they are in Russia. The physics is the same, in... but it's more, it's more, it's also, um, you know, one thing, one of the beautiful things we see in the movie, it's the openness of some scientists. I mean, first of all, I, I, I loved seeing Oppenheimer uh, uh, Getting engaged with the West, the wasteland, with Eliot, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, modern pictures, this this openness, and with politics. I mean, the science is not a closed thing. It's a. Uh, it's something that talks with the rest of the culture and should talk with the rest of the yeah. culture and should contribute. But ultimately, the decisions are not the scientists. Ultimately, the decision is society, is politics, and that's where we need. Uh, to calm down the current tension and the disasters, right. I think. Let's talk about, Christopher, if I could get you to do two screenings, right? I'd have you do one screening to the U.S. Congress. What would you hope they would take away from this? I think more than anything coming out of making the film and as, as it starts to go out into the world, um, I realized that, that, we talked about this earlier, our relationship with the fear of nuclear weapons ebbs and flows with the geopolitical situation. Right. And it shouldn't because the threat is constant. And, and very often, when you look back at history, some of the closest moments to nuclear disaster have actually been in times of relative calm geopolitically. So even though the situation in Ukraine kind of puts it more in the forefront mm -hmm. of people's minds, the truth is nuclear weapons are an extraordinarily dangerous thing to have lying around the house. And it is not something we should ever forget about, and it's not something we should take lightly. And one of the things that frightens me the most about, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about coming home from work, with anxiety, but when, when I hear in the media people, reasonable people talking about tactical nuclear weapons, right. as if this distinction can be made, and can be made via first politi politicians and media, sort of warming us up to the idea that perhaps there's a, a certain size of nuclear weapon that would be acceptable as opposed to the large ones. It's kind of the, like horrifying. the word clean coal. Yeah, it's, it's very mean, much clean coal, very tactical much. nukes. I don't think they exist. Well, and, and yeah. part of the but part of the fascination about Oppenheimer's as you dig in on his story, one of the things he did, you know, you talk about things I had to leave out of the film that are in Kai's book and mm -hmm. everything. One of the things that he did, he he was not naive. He did not get crushed by the system out of naivety. He was incredibly sophisticated, and he started talking about tactical weapons, bring the battle back to the battlefield because he wanted to play the army off against the Air Force, essentially. He mm -hmm. wanted to temper the threat of these giant genocidal H-bombs that the Air right. Force wanted to have in the air 24-7. But, you know, his he kept, you had it, I think he reiterated a few times in the movie, and it's held true, where his belief was, well, if we use it once, it'll mean they won't use it again. So far, that's been true. So it's interesting if you, there's a, a book um, by Hariri, one of the, um, 21 lessons for the 21st century mm -hmm. and one of the things he talks about is if you look at all of recorded and only partially recorded human history for most of that period of time 15 percent of the population died from violence from armed conflict mm -hmm. since 1945 it's been single digit percentages so Oppenheimer's and Bohr's dream that war would end did not come to pass obviously mm -hmm. uh, but as, as horrific as mm -hmm. the concept of mutual assured destruction is, yeah. it has acted as a restraint. And if you ask, so far, so far, so fingers far. crossed. But if you ask 
what role is nuclear deterrence playing right now in the Ukraine? It is containing the conflict. Now, it's scary because we don't know whether or not it's going to hold. But then again, you know what also nuclear deterrence has done? It's deterred how much we help. It has exactly. deterred our ability to help Ukraine more. A absolutely. And there's been, but, you know, why no fly zone? Because you've got to enforce it. But I would right. say we have seen what happens when wars spread across borders in Europe. Right. We saw it in 1939. We saw it in 1914. So, you know, one of my predecessors, um, uh, I think it was Norris Bradbury, said the role of nuclear weapons is to force world leaders to think of other solutions to their problems. Let me, one more screening I want you to have, which is in Silicon Valley. And what do you want those guys to take away from this film? I, I think what I would want them to take away is the concept of accountability. Um, not to, to sideline the conversation to the labor disputes going on in Hollywood right now, but yeah. a lot of it, when they're talking about things like AI, when we, we talk about these issues, they're all ultimately boiled down to the same thing, which is when you innovate with technology, you have to maintain accountability. And the rise of companies over the last 15 years who bandy about the word words like algorithm, mm -hmm. not knowing what they mean in any kind of meaningful mathematical <laughs> sense. These guys all know what an algorithm is, what it does. Right. People in my business talking about it, they just don't want to take responsibility for whatever that algorithm does. Yeah. And applied to AI, that's a terrifying possibility, terrifying. Not least because as AI systems go into the defense infrastructure, ultimately, they'll be in charge of nuclear weapons. And if we allow people to say that that's a separate entity from the person who's mm -hmm. wielding, programming, putting that AI into use, then we're doomed. It has to be about accountability. We have to hold people accountable for what they do with the tools that they have. Speaking of this stuff, you didn't use any CGI. Did not use That's a decision. much lighter uh, yeah. question to answer. So <laughs> it's a, a nice. Well, I say of, that, but, but no, no, you no, didn't. I, because, no, you know, I didn't. And, I, and I wonder, are you going to pledge to not use CGI going forward? You don't want to be involved in generative AI. I mean, are there certain things you won't do? No, not at all. Yeah. Um, and I think that AI is already a very powerful tool in, in our business as far as visual, effect, visual effects go. Mm -hmm. um, the, the interesting thing, as you, as you said, is computer graphics. To me, they're a touch anodyne. They're very versatile, but they tend to lack threat. Uh, mm. Of course, now they're seeming threatening in other ways. But, <laughs> but as far as your actual use of them, and, and as a filmmaker, you're trying to gauge you know, what colors are in your paint box, what techniques are you going to use, what's mm -hmm. the feeling. And so in an earlier film, at the end of, of one of my films, there's a nuclear explosion and Dark Knight Rises. It's meant to feel like it's far away enough that it's not going to affect mm. you and, and, and whatever. And so it's, you're actually meant to have a, a sense of, OK, we got away with it at the end. We did that with CG. It was beautifully rendered. My team, you know, incredible mm -hmm. research. But coming to portray the Trinity test, and obviously we're here, you know, leading up to the anniversary of the Trinity test tomorrow, but it was, it was like, okay, this, this has to feel dangerous. This has to feel beautiful and terrifying in equal measure. Yeah. And real-world imagery, real-world things, I think they, they have that, that bite. Well, I think beautiful and terrified. It's a pretty good... Uh, we should put that on a movie poster. Because it was beautiful and it was terrifying. Congratulations. Thank you. I think we, we made that as well. Thank you very much. And what a panel. Thank you, guys.